Well, good morning. Welcome to those gathered outside and those live streaming and any in the sanctuary. Good morning. It's the Lord's Day. I was so glad when they said unto us, let us go to the house of the Lord. My heart is like the pen of a ready writer. It overflows with a good thing. Fellowship I had with the saints this week in our community groups just can't even begin to describe the joy that we had uh, being together and opening the Word of God, little taste of heaven, the good fruits that have come out of this trial. I remind you uh, of our love for this flock and then those who are quarantined or health issues. And I just want you to, if you need the elders or anyone, just to come by and have communion, have fellowship with you, just whatever. I want you to reach out through the website. We just need each other, so I really am encouraging you to let's figure out a way to do that, and we can social distance and help you uh, during this season. This morning, if you'll turn to Romans chapter 4, we're going to continue our study in it. There's some amazing verses before us today, and I'm after your blessing this morning. Paul tells us of the one who's blessed. He's going to use it four times in four verses. This just couldn't probably come at a better time because unhappiness is really filling our land. Discontentment is at an all-time high. Frustrations are filling hearts. And the question is, why is that? Why is that? Well, we're, we're battling this COVID and all that's gone on with it. We've lost jobs. Some have had to close businesses. Statistics that you can't really get. Accuracy. Motives are being questioned. The politics of all of it. Black Lives Matter movement with rioting. Children with school events and sports being taken away and being done differently and graduations and hospitalizations where we can't go be with our loved ones and funerals where uh, we went to gravesides and you could only have 10 people and all your family couldn't gather to say goodbye to your loved one and we just want to be able to do church normal again. And that is what our passage is before us this morning and it really begs the question, and I want you to answer this this morning, is what is it that would make you happy? As you just sit here before you and God, what, what is it that would really make you happy? And I want you to, to answer that. Is it just my health? Financial security? If all was well with my family? I just need good friends to do life with. I need a perfect church. Just entertainment. I need coffee shops to be open. Constitution that's obeyed by our leaders, craft beer, vitamin D and exercise, or I just need to be able to accept myself and then I would be able to be happy. 2020 has been a great year to get the answer to this question. Maybe God planned it to show us all the answer to this question. What is it that really would make me happy? Some of you are getting the answer, and it's beautiful as a shepherd to see how you're beginning to behold. What makes me happy is Jesus Christ. And some of you are seeing what you need to be happy, and it's not what you say on Sunday morning at church. Jesus isn't even enough to fill your heart to give you true blessedness that we're going to look at today. And so my prayer for this sweet church is that every one of you would walk away this morning just filled with blessedness. One pastor said the gospel is designed to lift your burdens, to give you joy, and to make you strong to live the Christian life. This gospel is to lift burdens and give joy and make you strong. Strong to live the Christian life in Him. May God do that in our hearts this morning. And so let's go to the throne of grace and ask Him for such blessing. Father God, I desire for everyone hearing my voice to be blessed. And God, too, too many are looking for blessing in all the wrong places and all the wrong faces. God, I pray this morning, cut it all away and let us stare into the only thing that brings about blessedness. God, meet us. Lift burdens. Give joy. And make strong in Christ, I pray. Amen. The Bible tells us that we were made for joy. We were made for shalom, wholeness, peace with God. 
And the question is, what is it then that broke it? And sin entered the world, and it brought guilt, shame, fear, disgrace. Adam hiding now from God with fig leaves that he's made to try to hide. Man has been making fig leaves ever since to hide with our guilt and our shame before this God. Sin cuts me off from the true source of joy. So humanity spends all of its days trying to make a new route to find joy. How do I get there? What will bring joy since it's been separated from God because of sin? And so we have a whole world every day trying to find joy. Let's just look at our world. That is a day in America. How can I be happy? What can bring joy into my life? And what we have done in Romans 3, we learned of our depravity and our bondage to sin. And we've taken those, those chains that we learned. We, we're imprisoned and we're in nature's night. And we've tried to paint our chains with beautiful colors. We've tried to decorate our prisons and, and, and get Hobby Lobby pictures in our prisons and Ikea furniture and just try to make it look nice. Social media, we, we try to post to show a life that's happy and joyful and we're, we're trying to find this happiness and decorate it and say, in all my bondage and sin, I'm happy. Don't worry, be happy, won't work. I just want to focus on the positive and not the negative. That won't bring blessedness. And then there's the other end of the spectrum. I'm just honest. You don't hide it. You don't fake happy. You don't make believe. I just am who I am. I'm true. I'm real. I'm a real miserable human being. And I'm negative. And I'm like Eeyore. But I'm real. And that's better than fake. And none of those will ever bring blessedness. Even our best days of seeking happiness and blessedness, it's fleeting because it's the reality of a fallen world that just falls on us again and we realize that we're not going to find happiness in this world until sin is dealt with in our relationship with God. And so what characterizes this world is they're unhappy, they're unfulfilled, and they're not blessed people. And I can try and I can try and I can't get no satisfaction. Why? Sin has separated us from God. And sin has brought shame. And it's brought a guilt I can't get rid of. And a disgrace that I have to get rid of. And the church is the place that we end up sometimes with a list of do's and don'ts to take away shame. And the bottom line is I, I get filled with more shame because the truth of God's Word goes forth and I realize more of my sin and my shame and my guilt. And it just grows. Church is just increasing it and it's not bringing the blessedness that I'm looking for. I want you to do me a favor. Whether you're, if you're at home, skip it. But out here and maybe in the sanctuary, raise your hand if you believe you're a Christian. I want you to take note of those who didn't. Go talk to them afterwards. Now I want you to raise your hand. How many of you believe that there's no sin in your account and God looks at you right now as if you've never sinned and all your guilt is gone and you have no shame and no disgrace before God? Show hands. You guys have good elders. That's beautiful. If you can't see it, almost the same amount of hands went up. You just blew my whole illustration. I hope some of you are lying. <laughs> you should feel shame. <laughs> I'm finding more and more as a minister for 30 years that many walk around in the church with a weight of sin, with guilt and shame that they're trying to get rid of by being a better person and serving others and learning doctrine and knowing that the blessed life that Paul is talking about here in this passage, and Jesus talked about in the Psalm, Psalm 1, blessed is the man. This morning, I have good news of great joy for you. And the city of David was born for you a Savior, and He will save His people from their sins. And this morning, I, I pray for your blessing. I pray that burdens would be lifted. Joy 
would flow and you would be made strong and empowered to live this Christian life. And let's go before our God and we will ask for that and then we'll open up this word. Father, I love this flock with all my heart and I know their burdens and I pray that this morning your, your truth would lift them. God, I know there's some without joy and all their rules and rituals and keepings and learning has just made it heavier. I pray this morning, God, the joy that you say you give them and you leave for them, I pray this morning, give them joy and make them strong by the beauty of this gospel to overcome the sin that's just fighting them and making them feel guilt and shameful. Get, empower them in the gospel this morning. Make them strong in Christ and bless them with that. Tend your word and do what no human being can do. God, by your spirit, move and work. Amen. I talked to a sweet couple yesterday and she shared, we're sharing our testimonies and she was sharing her favorite preachers are Paul Washer and John MacArthur. Not bad choices at all. <laughs> and just her whole journey in doctrine and truth. And then she threw me for a little loop. And she said, and I got saved last Sunday. <laughs> I finally got it. I got it in Romans 4. And I'm just praying if there's any others who are carrying that same weight that this lady's blessed by believing. This morning, we're going to look at three aspects of Abraham's righteousness. We looked at the first two last week. First one was imputation. And we looked at Abraham, the father of the faith for Israel. And how did he get right with God? They believed that it was by his good works. And God said all he did, is he believed God, that God would bring blessing through a seed and that seed is going to be Jesus Christ, but he had it in a shadowy form. He believed God, and it was logizomide was the word we began looking at, and it means to credit to your account. The righteousness of God was put in his account, and he's declared righteous before God. He's brought into a relationship with him. You don't get in there any other way. He believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, imputed his account. You get it by faith. And then he clarified it, our second point in verses 4 through 5. And he used the illustration of a, a working one, which you, when you work, it's, it's a wage that you earn, and a non working one, it's, it's grace, it's a gift. And he says he will give it to the one who's ungodly. It's, it's not the one who's cleaned himself up and morally nice and a better person than your neighbor. It's the ungodly one who will look upon this gospel and believe what God says. That one will get righteousness. It's the opposite of everything the world teaches you. And now this morning, we're going to see it proven in verses 6 through 8. Verse 6. <clears throat> Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Like eight times he's told us apart from works and faith. So now he's going to call David to the stand. We have the greatest the father of Israel, Abraham, and now we're going to take the greatest king of Israel, the great soldier who took down Goliath, conquered many foreign armies, the poet of the Psalms. Israel was looking for a descendant of David who would sit on his throne and rule forever and throw down their enemies. Abraham and David, the key figureheads, and they're both testifying, I want you to hear this, to justification by faith alone. Look at me. Verse 6, 7 and 8. Blessed. Blessed. Verse 9, this is the blessing that comes on the circumcised. You're blessed. There's a dear brother in this church named Sean Kissman, and I love walking up to him. Every time I ask him, how you doing? Blessed. Blessed. And right now, the guy has trials coming from every angle, every side, and every time, how are you doing even this morning? Blessed. You know what that means? Circumstances are not what's blessing him. What's blessing him is what we're going to look at this morning. The word blessed, Freiburg, 
is that it means transcendent happiness. Outright joy. Literally, when we went through the, through the, uh, the uh, Beatitudes, it was to be envied. To, the world looks on you and you're, you're envied. It, it transcends the seen and the here and the now. The one who's blessed has this transcendent happiness that goes beyond circumstances. And so this, this blessedness is not going to be, how's my life going and how's my country doing? and how, it's, just, it's not even, how's my heart doing? It's God and what he's done. In Jesus Christ. This is a condition where you're content and happy in God. I don't need to look any further than Him. And so blessed does not mean things will go well for you. That's the world's blessedness. The world's blessedness will always be, how is my life doing? And they will go up and down based on how their life is doing. And that's why you're going to be envied because everything could be falling apart and you could lose everything and you're, you're blessed. And they're going to envy you to say, how do you get there? T- tell me, what's the hope within you? What is it? This is the key to Christian life is we're blessed. Jesus said, blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men cast insults at you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Blessed are you when they kick your teeth in and hate you and reject you. That's how they've treated anyone who proclaimed the true name of Jesus Christ. So this does not mean blessed are the healthy. Blessed are the admired. Blessed are the prosperous. It does not mean your circumstances will go well. But between you and God, it is well. And it means the great separator between you and God is sin. And so it has to mean that sin has been dealt with rightly and fully. And in that now you can be blessed. So get this. Unhappiness is not dealing with sin rightly. If you're unhappy this morning and you're a child of God, the reason is you're not dealing with sin rightly. That's the problem. You're dealing with it by uh, events, by people, how they like you, by the fulfillments that you're feeling, the nice things that you have. You're not dealing with it rightly by that. This is what the gospel does to a man or woman or child. When God opens a heart, your eyes see and your mind understands the gospel, and you see now, logizomai, and you finally get that God really does give me this to my account, the righteousness. You're a blessed man or woman. You're blessed. And I've been praying that God would show you all this this morning. So hard for me to watch people who aren't blessed. I I, I want this for you. I want you to be blessed today. That your hearts would be flooded with this truth and everything that would just fall off that's keeping you from this transcendent happiness that God desires for us. This is how this truth will go from academic to reality in your life. Because quite frankly, there's some of you sitting here that still don't get this. For some people, this section has changed your life and you've testified of it. And some, it's still cold and sterile. Truths you nod your head to. And some, you're still dealing with sin and guilt by the law, and by hiding. And it's not working. Keep making new commitments. I'll work harder. I'm going to start going to church. You you just keep dealing with your sin by law and, and by hiding. You can be sitting here this morning and be hiding. And there's there's a way to get blessed. So this morning we get a look at a man who did just that. A man after God's own heart. Sin, he didn't deal with God's way and he dealt with it man's way first. And we're going to see what that does to a soul. And what you're going to see is it brings depression. It brings a deep, dark depression. I can't say all depressions are the result of this. I would never say that. There's so many different things. But some depression can come because of this. You're not letting this truth take over your mind and heart 
You won't believe like Abraham did. And that's your problem. And as a result, your, your blessedness is still circumstances. The church is jammed full of people who the only time you're blessed is when your circumstances are going right. And God wants something more. He wants people who can be persecuted and spit on and rejected and go through trials and a blessedness that won't go away because he won't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I have something better than any doctor could give you this morning. I give you to you the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if it will be believed, you'll be blessed. I give you an answer for your guilt that you're feeling as you sit here this morning. For your shame and your disgrace. That's filling your heart and life and stilling your joy that God has designed for you to have. So let's get it. Verse 6, the gospel that we've been laboring in, justification by faith in Christ alone, all through chapter 3 and 4, what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness in verse 6. It's his faith, not that he was perfect like the Jews purported in his day. It was, it was a sinner who believed God. But what about David? David. David is the proud owner of the most infamous sin in the history of the nation till Peter came and trumped him. Royal rape and murder. And a few chapters after this rape and murder is recorded, we hear God say of David, there's no one as righteous as David in the land. Come on, God, we just read verses 11 through 12. How do you say that? Did you forget chapter 12? Yeah. Yeah. I don't get so mind it to my son. And I don't get so mind my righteousness to David. There's no one like him as righteous in the land. Paul's going to call David to the stand to show us the other side of the amazing gospel. And not only is the righteousness of God put to your account, but the unrighteousness of each one of us as believers is not put to your account. It's not logizo mind to your record, to your account. And Paul's going to show us this by quoting Psalm 32. I want you to flip over there. Psalm 32. <laughs> Most of us are very familiar with Psalm 51, and Greg read it to us this morning. And that was David's, David's great confession when Nathan came and confronted him with his sin that he was trying to hide and he was trying to just go on with his life and it was bringing depression. And, and I just want you to hear this. That's not how you deal with sin. And Psalm 32 is a reflection on David's Psalm 51. He's looking back on it and what it did to him and what repentance and the fruit that came from it. And so let's take it up. And as, before we do, I'm just going to, set a little context with you um, this morning. So 2 Samuel is where this is being taken from, chapters 11 through 12. And I went through it a few months ago, so you don't need to turn there. But in verse 1, we're told when the kings go out to battle, David stayed home. And we're told he's sitting up on his roof. And that's not weird. It, it, it wasn't, he's sitting up on, on a roof with binoculars was common. That was their, their place where they had their siesta and they would go up on the roof. And while he's up there, he sees Bathsheba. And he sees that she's beautiful. And he acquires about who she is. And now the sin is growing and building in David's heart. And he finds out it's Uriah the Hittite's wife. One of the most faithful and loyal men in his army, full of integrity as the story flushes out. And David has his men bring her to him. And he commits adultery with Bathsheba and he thinks it's over and done and then he gets a note from her and says I'm with child and so David now has to cover it up and so he was he has Uriah sent from the battle and he, he he wants him to come home and lie with his wife so no one will suspect him but Uriah had such integrity he slept on the front porch 
He said, how could a servant of the king enjoy an evening with his wife while the, the men are out at battle fighting? So David's like, I need a plan B. I'll liquor him up, and then he'll lie with his wife. And again, he sleeps on the porch. Plan C. I'm going to have him killed in war. And then I can marry Bathsheba and cover it that way. And so the plan is he, he goes up to the front of the battle and, and they retreat and he gets shot with an arrow and he dies and Joab sends a message back to let David know he died. And so now David feels as if he can go on with his life because he, sit, he hid his sin and everything's okay now. And he marries Bathsheba. Months later, God sends Nathan and he tells that famous story about a little ewe lamb and the guy who stole it and he had all the other land and David is so furious. His hypocrisy is looming. And, and, and Nathan says, David, you're that man. And David repents before God and God forgives him. And that was the psalm that Greg read this morning is that God completely forgave him for all of his sin when he repented and confessed it. And so my question is, how do you deal with such guilt? How do you deal with such shame? Your heart and your sin is open and laid bare before God. I'm no longer a good guy. I'm unrighteous. I deserve eternal punishment. I'm too slimy to come near to God. I got to keep him away. Ever felt that way? I want to ask for a show of hands. This is tricky because it can be hard to diagnose. You can come to church every Sunday and read your Bible and serve and evangelize while you're hiding from God with your shame and your disgrace and your guilt. That's not allowing you to have blessedness. And you can't cry, the nearness of God is my delight. That's foreign. But God, I will change and I'm going to make up for what I did so you'll not be disgusted with me anymore. Let me work, which last week is a working one. Let me go do something to, to appease you. And what's that going to look like? In Psalm 32, verse 3, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. Selah, take it in. Pause. There's some here this morning who are carrying burdens of past sins and even present sins, maybe on the internet all night, gaming all night, gluttonous eating, ice cream can't bring makarios, which means blessedness. You won't forgive someone. You won't reconcile with someone. Maybe you had a parent who died and you were at odds with them when they died. You stole. Adultery. And you're trying to go on with God and your life and with other people with all of your shame and your guilt and your fear and you're not dealing with sin rightly and you're just sitting here with that depression that David had. So many hiding in the church. Not dealing with sin the way that I'm going to show you now. I want your blessedness, not your miserableness. That, doing that brings miserable. You're just miserable. There's nothing. And there's a better way that God wants to bring you into this blessedness. How can I be forgiven for what I've done? What is the way, David? King. Rape. Murder. Nathan says, God gave you everything, David. If you would have asked for anything more, he would have gave it to you. Is that how you repay God? Shame and guilt because of his deep love for God. How do you deal with a guilt like that? Psalm 32.5 is how you do it. I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Selah. Take it in. That's it. 
Go to verse 1. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Three truths that David uh, took David from despair to blessed. Here's how you go from despairing and sin and guilt and shame to being blessed before your God. Here's how you deal with it. I pray if anyone needs this this morning that God would apply this. First, his sin was forgiven. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven. This is the only way to remove guilt. It was rightful guilt. And we all stand guilty before God. And our sin has brought it. And it's, he says, your lawless deeds, that, that, that word means the violation of law or to transgress. We would call it the act of commission, the things that you have done, the transgressing of God's law and the sin that you did. All of my violations of what God has commanded of me have been forgiven. It's not a future action, it's completed. It's called a nomic eris, which means a timeless general fact. Your sins have been forgiven. The root word in the Greek is a theomy, and it means to send off or to send away. It's used in 1 Corinthians 7, 12 on divorce. To the rest, I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who's an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, let him not a theomy her. Let him not send her away. And here it is, your, your guilt and your shame, it's sent away. It's forgiven. It's released. Separation is the idea. God separating the, the sinner's transgression and guilt from the sinner. God separates it. They've been sent away as far as the east is from the west. And this would render you blessed to have a scapegoat who takes your sin off into the wilderness of forgetfulness. Second, his sin was covered. And whose sins have been covered uh, this is more of a departure from what is right. This would be the sins of omission. This is not loving God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength and your neighbor as yourself. These are the things that you should do that you don't. Do you see the fullness of forgiveness? The things that you have done and the things that you should have done are forgiven. They've been covered. Back to that word propitiation at the mercy seat of God. They've been covered by the blood of Jesus and forgiven and cleansed. And the third thing, if you'll look in verse 8 of Romans 4, blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. I want you to let that take your breath away. Here's our word, logizomai. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not logizomai to your account. You want to be blessed? Your sins are not going to be put to your record. And I want you to ponder every sin that you're aware of that you committed by omission or commission. You, know, you just know, you don't even know how big they are. You know the tip of the iceberg and God knows all of it. Do you feel your guilt and shame and disgrace? Don't you just want to hide? Just, God, I just want to hide for who I am and what I do. And now I want you to realize by grace, God won't put them to your account. They're not going to go in your ledger. He's saying, David is saying, happy is the man whom God has given a clean slate. There's no black marks in your book. If you could open up my ledger of God's book for Ken Murphy, and when you open it up, the sins in my account it's an empty account. There's, there's nothing in it. Do you hear that? There's nothing in your account before God. I love the double negative in the Greek here. U may. It says, He will no, not never, count them against you. It can't ever happen. He's never going to count your sins against you. Open up the book. Look, look up your name. Let me look at the sin. Where is it? It's gone. It's not in my book. And that's hard for us because in the human realm, when someone accepts your apology and they go, I forgive you, 
and it lingers in their mind and they bring it up. In marriages, they love to bring it up again. Did you think about this? Remember when you did that? It's going to be brought up again in the future. God is not like that. It will not be brought up. It's been separated as far as the east is from the west. And I just want to let the Old Testament proclaim this. Listen to a few verses. Isaiah 43, 25. I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, says God, and I will not remember your sins. Isaiah 38, 17. Lo, for my own welfare I have great bitterness. It is thou who hast kept my soul from the pit of nothingness. For thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. Psalm 103, 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Micah 7, 19. He will again have compassion on us and he will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Jeremiah 31, 34. And they shall not teach again, each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me in this new covenant. From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, in the glory of the new covenant, for I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Jeremiah 50, 20. In those days and at that time, declares the Lord, a search will be made for the iniquity of Israel, but there will be none. And for the sins of Judah, but they will not be found. For I shall pardon those whom I leave as a remnant. And so my question to you this morning is how can he do that? How can he do that? And we've learned how can he be just and do that? Well, because he doesn't just take your sins out of your ledger and throw them into the sea. He takes your sins and he logizomizes them to someone else's account. And this time he logizomizes them to Jesus' account and puts them up on a cross and he becomes guilty of every sin that you've ever committed. And Jesus propitiates the wrath of God for our iniquity. The one with a perfect ledger took my sin upon himself and he bore the full wrath of God for my iniquity. So that now my ledger is empty. This is the only remedy for your sin and your guilt. And I'll tell you this, religion cannot take care of this problem. Eating will not fix this. Movies cannot change it. Vacation, alcohol, drugs, Everything you're running to to fix this can't fix it. It helps you cope. usually makes things worse. But it never gives blessedness. And that's what David and God are offering to you this morning. Forgiveness. I love that word. I can be forgiven for all of my sin. Though your sins were as scarlet, they can be made as white as snow. Do you see why the one who gets this is blessed? The world promises, promises us all of its blessings. And unless it's forgiveness of sin, you will never be blessed. Throw down all the fake attempts to try to get blessed other than this. The forgiveness of sin. This is the glorious Gospel. Young kids, college, quit looking for blessedness any other way. If you want a blessed life, believe and it will be logizomai to your account as righteousness. This is the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ and it is the best news. I understand more and more what Rutherford meant when he looked out and he said, oh dark sun, oh moon, oh dark stars, oh bright and glorious Christ. Everything else pales. It's darkness to this beautiful Christ who has removed our iniquities from us and bore the sin. Whatever has you down this morning, I want you to bring it to this truth. Blessed is the man or woman whose sin 
the Lord will in no way ever count against him. When we open up your ledger this morning, there's only one thing in it. The infinite, perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. Just filling up your ledger. And God looking at you saying justified. Not guilty. Blessed. The heroes of our faith, Abraham and David, were blessed as ungodly men, not workers, but believers in the God who promised righteousness that he would give through the seed that would come. May you all be blessed this morning in believing this glorious gospel. And may we be a church that has it at the center of all that we do. May we be a church that believes it and we sow it into each other's lives on a daily basis. And we have koinonia in it and how to share it and how to take it. We're, we're just a team united. How do we get this out? How do we take it to as many people on the face of the earth till we die? This gospel's too good to be the best kept secret. And so let's join in koinonia and give our lives to spread such a glorious gospel. But it begins with you believing it and being blessed and going out into the world where they're all miserable and sad and we shine like lights who are blessed because of what God has done in Christ. I pray that we would put him on display. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you for the blessing that we have pray that every one of us, when we are asked, how's it going, we would say blessed. We're blessed. Because in my record, in my account, I'm, I have more sin than I can imagine, but I open up my book and it's gone. It's not there, and I, I'm so glad you didn't just blow it away. Thank you that you put it on your own son and you did not spare him, but delivered him up for us all, oh God. Thank you for piercing him through for our iniquities. Thank you, God, by grace. You destroyed your son so you didn't have to destroy us. You gave him wrath so we could receive mercy. God, thank you for my ledger. I feel so free. No guilt. You're not guilty. Shame. Gone. Fear has been driven out by your love. God, we thank you for this gospel. And I thank you that what you have put in my account is the perfect righteousness of Christ. So now I can stand in your presence blameless with great joy. God, let every soul be blessed. Whatever they're facing, if it's cancer, uh, there's just nothing that can take away how blessed we are in Jesus Christ. To God be the glory. Amen.